Well, in this uh, chapter, is really, I want to talk about a couple things with respect to this video. But we're going to concentrate primarily on what we would refer to as the dividend or the constant growth model of uh, calculations for the values of stock. So let's start with the very basics of the formula. There are three items we need to know. We need to know K sub S. Some textbooks use this R sub S. But this number here, and, and let me write these in as we go through this. This number here, we're going to talk about this is the required return. This is the required return on the asset. And we'll talk about how we calculate that a little bit later, but it is a very important formula, very important number that we need in this calculation. So it's the required return. G is the growth of future dividends. It's the growth of future dividends. Let's make these make this just a wee little bit smaller so we can uh, put it in the perspective here. Right. So there we go. It's the growth of future dividends. And we'll see that as we go on. The D1 is next year's dividend. To get next year's dividend, we need to know this year's dividend. So let's go ahead and start this example. We have a company that paid $1.50 in dividends most recently. This company historically has paid growth rates of dividends in the market of around a 6% growth. So the growth rate of future dividends historically for this company is the 6%. Now, the required return is based on the riskiness of the asset. So in this case, let's assume that the required rate of return for this company is 12%. So when we plug this in, 12% is the required return. Growth rate is 6%. We have a $1.50 current dividend, but with 6% growth, that'll be $1.59 next year. That gives us a stock value of $26.50. So now what we have to talk about is how can we find these variables? The, the information is fairly simple to put in here, but we need to have some way to calculate what goes in to these numbers. So how do we calculate K sub S and G? How do we find those numbers? So let's first start by K sub S. And these numbers are not going to match up above here, but the risk-free rate of return, we talked about this in a, in a bond chapter. This is the rate of return that you would find on a 30-year treasury bond. Currently, 30-year treasury bonds, you know, we could probably find this fairly quickly. Let's go to Yahoo Finance, finance.yahoo, right? We go to finance.yahoo. when it has totally loaded up takes a little bit so here's the market data let's go to bonds so you go to market data, you go to bonds, and the first thing we should see that comes up with respect to bonds, once it has worked its way through the system, again, uh, I'm assuming just Sunday night things are just a little bit slow. It didn't get us to bonds, so we need to go to bonds. Go to bonds. Now it's bonds. Here's a 30-year. The 30-year treasury is 2.54. So let's go back here. The risk-free rate returns 2.54 percent. K sub M or R sub M. This essentially is the average stock market return. The average return on the stock market. So that's where we get. That's that number that goes in there. Not market. Market. Okay. So we need to know the average return on the stock market. So historically, again, there'll be a chapter that we talk about the risk analysis of. Uh, of the marketplace itself. But let's just say in general, 
that the average rate of return for stocks is around 11.5%. And that is historically correct uh, over the last 80 some odd years. We'll discuss that in a, in a later chapter. The only other thing we need to know now is what is the beta of the company? Beta is a measurement of risk. You can find this if you uh, look up a particular company. I've been following all along here. I've been following uh, Molson Coors, and you're following a company maybe with your uh, research as well. And that number, as soon as you get into the company's website, it's right here. For Coors, it's 1.36. So I can type that in here, 1.36, and the required rate of return that I have for Coors is 14. Uh, 0.73%. So that's a number I could put right there. What else could I do? Well, let's find out what the stock price is. The stock price is 75.40 for core, 75.40. The most recent dividend for cores is right here. It's a dollar 64. Let's put a dollar 64 there. Not yes, dollar 64. So now we need to figure out well, what is the yield for this company. Well, uh, the yield, we can either uh, calculate it, which is D1 divided by the price, or we can find out what it is according to the market. Here we have the dividend and the yield. So the yield is 2.2% on this market, 2.2%. So there we go. So what they're saying is K sub S should be 8.2%, a little bit different than 14%. But we need to utilize these numbers to figure out exactly how uh, we want to move forward with, uh, with this com particular company. Maybe we just want to average them together. So where did this 6% come from? It comes from C7. C7 is the growth rate. Well, actually, we haven't even fully calculated G yet. So let's not worry about this number yet. I got a little bit ahead of myself. So the next question is, how can we find... The growth rate, we need to find this G. Well, there's two ways we can do that. We can do time value, or we can do earnings growth rate. So let's think about the earnings growth rate first. We need to find what the dividend payout ratio is. So if we go down here to key statistics, maybe we can find these numbers. So we go down here. Again, we need the dividend payout ratio. And as we scroll down, you're going to find out, here's the payout ratio. The payout ratio for cores is 54%. The dividend payout ratio is 54%. Now, how this all fits is part of the lecture uh, in the course. So you can find the more detailed uh, description of how some of these things come about. But you can find this information. It's all readily available. The next thing we need to know is the return on equity. Well, where can we find that? Thank God they actually have some numbers from time to time to find. Here's the return on equity, 6.26%. So let's 6.26%. So one of the growths that they're predicting is this 2.88%. Well, that's fine. That's one estimate of growth. We can also use time value. Now, this is where things get a little bit more difficult. What we want to do, or what we can do, is go up here to historical prices. Here's historical prices. And they have a radio button here that you can request dividends only. I've asked you to do this actually in the class with a company that you're following. So you should have this information readily at hand. What we want is the last four dividends here. So we're going to adjust that last number and see what this is. So we have what? 3 times 37 plus 0 0.41. That's the most recent dividend. So we have, let me put a formula in here, equals 3 times 0.37 plus 0 0.41. So the most recent dividend out there is, is actually the same, more accurately, is $1.52. There may be a a dividend that hasn't been uh, published yet or it's on its way. So I still have a dollar fifty two. Now what we need to do is we need to go down a couple years. So here's there's four, eight. So let's just go down here. I'm just gonna pick down here. 
we're going to pick these numbers down here. It's 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 times 32, that's 64 and 64. That's a dollar twenty-eight. So let's say here that the dividends of it was a dollar twenty-eight. And I'm going to plug in a number here just to see what happens. Let's use the number three. So in a three-year window, the dividends have grown roughly 5.9%. So we have two estimates or guesses, if you will, as to the growth rate of dividends. Now these are based on historical data. So if you take an average of that, right, 2.8 plus, let's say 6 plus 3, so roughly have around 4.5%. So if we just want to use that, we could put 4.5% as the growth rate. We might want to say, well, is cores growing? Are they retrenching? We can adjust this growth rate if we want to, but let's keep it this way. It's just the historical growth rate. So now we have two estimates of required return. It's either 14.7 or 6.7, right? So we plug those together. 14 to 6, what's in the middle there? Roughly uh, 20, it's like 10%. So let's go ahead and plug in 10% is the average. Yeah, we don't need to use the average. We could use the average. 14.73, I like that because I think the stock is pretty risky. But what this is telling us now is that this stock has a value of $15.53 and we know that the market is currently selling for $75. So again, using real data creates sometimes a little bit of a problem for us. Um, you know, it doesn't always give us, not every model works really well with, uh, with every stock. So we want to use several different models to get some ideas of relative values of, of stocks. But that's essentially how the stock valuation model works. You want to compare the stock value to the stock price. In this case, the price is well exceeds the stock value. So if we assume that these numbers are correct, we may be uh, very desperate in trying to figure out, you know, what should the real value be? Here's an example. Why don't we do this? Let's use the lower growth rate of dividends. Let's be conservative. 2.88. Now it's 13.20%. What if the cost of capital is really 5.08? We can look at that. Now it's $71. Using the lower estimates gets us a number that's a little bit closer, at least, to the stock price. Again, uh, this is there for you to analyze, for you to play with the numbers. Um, keep in mind, these are historic numbers. We really want future numbers, not historic numbers. Um, but it's, a, it's an exercise that... Uh, can at least give you a picture of what the value of the stock should be. As a side note, there are a couple of homework problems that tell you what next year's dividend will be. And again, you have to kind of watch the spreadsheet. It says, if D1 is given, you enter it here. So if I were to tell you that the dividend expected at the end of next year is $2, you could plug that in here, and of course, there you see it shows up. Now the stock says it's worth $90.91. The only problem with using this is, as I mentioned here, don't forget to delete this after you do this problem because this number flows right to that point via formula. So uh, you don't want to get the, the incorrect answers, if you will. So again, that's how stock valuation can work and how you can solve for uh, some of the problems within this course.